jungle. This is an issue that people don't want to look at. This is an issue that people are embarrassed to talk about. Um, and I curse. I get angry. I get really angry because I feel, I go back to that little kid who sat and no, nobody was hearing her. Um, I was sexually abused by my live-in female nanny from the time that I was 10 years old until I was 16. Um, the abuse went on 365 days a year, seven days a week. Um, there was no breaks and there was no time off. She was always there. And aside from the sexual abuse, there was also, as you can imagine, physical abuse, um, emotional abuse, and, and that went on, like I said, every day for six years. Eventually, um, when I found the courage to share with a friend and then um, a counselor what was going on, I was able to get help. Um, but we were in some really dire straits. And going through, um, you know, the healing process as a family, um, on my own, becoming a thriving survivor, and then trying to do um, and use what had happened to me to make it different for other people and that's really where Lauren's kids came from um, a need a want and a desire to make it different for other kids um, but you know then on my own journey for through healing and going to school I went to the University of Miami and got a degree in elementary education and creative writing and learned that education is the cornerstone for how we can prevent childhood sexual abuse. 95% of sexual abuse is preventable with education and awareness. It's 95%. One in three girls and one in five boys will be sexually abused before they're 18 years old. So that's before they're leaving this system. So I kept thinking to myself, how can we make this different? We need to educate, not just children, but we need to re-educate parents. We need to educate teachers. We need parent teachers to know how to report abuse, what to look for. When I went to school, there were things that pe teachers should have noticed. There were things I wished my parents noticed. And I think we needed to create a culture shift. And that's what Safer Smarter Kids does. You know, I see a world I see a state where we will have a curriculum for every child who goes through that system, whether it's going to be the middle school and high school when it comes to dating violence. I want a world where when these kids go to college, they not only know how to write and read and do their math, but they know not to run at dusk with earbuds in so someone can grab them, so they lock their dorm door. We need to, again, like we talked about earlier, create that culture shift. So there's the curriculum, and I'm so passionate about the educational piece of what we do. We just need to educate the culture on the pattern and really kind of draw a line in the sand. You're either with us or you're against us, in a way. Hi friends, welcome to Safer Smarter Kids. We're going to spend some time together learning important rules and lessons to help you stay safe. I'll be practicing these lessons with my friends in class and you'll have a chance to practice them in your classroom with your teacher. Are you guys ready? Let's get going! If you look at the, the, the tremendous amount of work that Lauren in a very short period of time has accomplished, it's a miracle. And it's a miracle that is saving children's lives. I told her recently, there's no way to know, but we know deep down inside she's already prevented many, many children from going through the horrific uh, challenges that she has had to face and the, the most uh, difficult of circumstances. Um, tough to write, very tough to write, um, very, um, honest, very dark, um, you know, probably one of the most honest pieces that, that I have ever done, um, because up until that point when the book came out, 
we kept my mom's illness very, very private within our family. And, you know, people would ask when we first started, you know, oh, you know, your mom had a chocolate store and your dad was a lobbyist. Like, where were they really? Like, that doesn't make sense. And so when we really started to write the book, um, it was about how can I be as honest and respectful of everybody's story that I could be? And how can I put out a product and how could we put something out that wasn't too much for people to handle? And how could I respect my own pain and my own, you know, some of those experiences that weren't okay for me to put out there? And so it was a really interesting balancing act. It was um, one of the hardest things that I had ever done. Um, really, um, a lot of fallout personally from the book. Um, you know, stopped talking to my mom for two years after the book came out. Um, you know, constantly working on that relationship. But, um, you know, one of my prouder, proudest um, moments, um, you know, with the book was having, was having that book out there and, and seeing what it was doing for survivors. Faith is tough. As a survivor of abuse, um, I found myself very angry at God, very angry at how could this God who's so great allow this to happen to me for so long. And I remember, you know, praying every night. And I remember my prayer growing up. And I say it to this day. Now it's changed a little bit, but when I was growing up, and you know, you can, it's, it's kind of funny, but um, dear God, thank you for making me healthy and green and for all that you've done. Dear God, Grandma, Grandpa, Aunt Mame, Uncle Bill, please make this stop. And I would pray to my grandparents, I would pray to everybody who was in heaven to make this stop every day as the abuse was happening, please God make this stop. And I think for a long time, and it, it happens with a lot of survivors, you misplace your anger at your offender on God. And in my journey through healing and through growing, you know, I've learned that I was misplacing that anger. And that, you know, there is a greater power out there, whether it is you believe in God, the universe, I mean, whoever it is that you believe in. Um, you know, I, I feel that I'm a very spiritual person and I believe that there is a higher being out there who is who did step in. But the things that happened to me happened to me for a reason. And it's taken me a long, long time, 12 years, to find my footing in faith again. Well, um, I think we have to go back like a couple more steps. One night I was driving home from class. I was getting my master's degree. I was listening to NPR and I heard about a man who was 400 pounds, diabetic, but walked across the entire country to raise awareness for diabetes and to lose weight and get healthy. And I thought to myself, well, if he can do this, I certainly can too. So I called my dad and my husband at the time and I said, I'm gonna walk across the country to bring awareness for child sexual abuse. And they both said, you're crazy, we'll talk tomorrow. And anybody who knows me knows that if I set my mind to something, I'm gonna do it. And so he said, well, my dad said to me, why don't you train, you know, see if you can do this. This is not a, an easy thing, figure out if you can do it. And so. And we decided that we would have the walk in April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. This was four years ago. And I started training and come November, um, I said, I'm doing this, so we better start figuring our stuff out here because otherwise I'm just gonna be walking on some highway somewhere and it's not gonna be very effective. Um, so everybody thought I was crazy. And um, we really quickly rallied and we had some, we had wonderful sponsors, Ashford Environmental, people coming on board. We had a bus, we had two cars um, from AutoNation, we had everything wrapped um, by, um, um, by Metro Signs, which has always been such a great sponsor to us. And people kind of were looking at me like I was some kind of crazy. But we literally walked from the home that I was sexually abused in all the way to Tallahassee. 30, 35, 25 miles a day, every day, on the highways, pounding the pavement, going to sexual assault treatment centers, having survived. I had no idea 
really, that that survivors would respond the way that they did. I think the first year that I did the walk, my thought was I was doing it for myself. I think that I really needed to go through a very painful physical experience to get beyond the things that happened to me. And really I wanted almost one person to walk it through and really experience, I wanted it to be hard, I wanted it to be terrible so that I could get beyond that and I felt like I needed to. Um, and the walk really was a, you know, like a metaphor for what your healing journey is as a, as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. It seems so long. It seems impossible to get to the end goal. But with guidance and support and love of family and friends, one day at a time, one step at a time, you will get to the end.